Okay. Um, hello, my name is Michael Lavers. I'm the international news editor for the Washington Blade. And I'm actually here in Miami Beach this week. And so I'm really honored to have the chance to moderate this discussion this evening. And I want to quickly introduce the folks who will be joining us. Um, we have Ignacio Aguirre. He's a longtime volunteer with the uh, Latino, Latino History Project. We have Leti Gomez, who's also a longtime volunteer. Uh, Jose Gutierrez, the uh, founder of the History Project. And then last but certainly not least is Lisbeth Melendez Rivera, longtime LGBTQ activist from Puerto Rico and a longtime supporter of the uh, project. So thank you all so much for taking part in this. And I would be really remiss to not start this conversation by just touching base with everyone and seeing first, you know, how is everybody doing with what's been going on in the U.S. over the last uh, several days and weeks, and especially in D.C. with everything that we saw happen um, in the last uh, few days. So I just want to, you know, have a chance to touch base and see how everybody is doing and just what are your thoughts about everything that's been going on so far. So um, maybe Letty can start. Sure. Um, well, I have to say that um, the day that George Floyd was murdered um, and for many days after that, I was just uh, numb. Uh, I think it was just such a horrific, just such a horrific act that uh, one that this officer, one human being, would do this to another human being, and that the other officers did not even assist to help him when he was, you know, c clearly uh, crying out for help, and no one came, none of them came to his assistance, none of them tried to pull that guy off. And so, yeah. and then the, then the, you know, the protests that have followed is, you know, um, for the most part have really shown that it's, you know, and the diversity of the groups have shown, of the protesters have shown that, you know, um, black people are not alone. I mean, people are coming, rallying, but, you know, it's gonna take all of us. And um, I'm, I'm feeling more hopeful today. And you know, after we were talking about this earlier, I'm feeling more hopeful, but it's, uh, it's time for just, you know, to put, keep the pressure on. And, you know, now it's, it's ballot, you know, what are we, what are we gonna do at the ballot box to put people in place that are gonna make change that will help us all. Yeah. And Lisbeth, especially yeah. African-American community. Lisbeth, how are you doing? How, what's, what are your thoughts? Um, so, I, you know, um, I think I echo Letty's sentiment. There's a sense of shock. Uh, I currently exist in a world in which, um, you know, we are called to do pastoral care with a lot of the folks who are involved in all of this. And so while I've not been out on the streets um, for a variety of personal reasons, I have been deeply involved in taking care of folks on the other side. Right? What happens when you come home after you be beaten up? What happens when you are marching with your collar on the street and the cops attack you, run you over, uh, as was the case both in Minneapolis and in Columbus, uh, where clergy and people of faith were marching together, particularly black clergy and black people of faith were marching together, flanked by white clergy to protect them, and the cops kind of like run away, right? So. I am not surprised uh, because we've seen so much violence in this country, and yet I'm so disappointed on what, you know, how particular sectors of our society have reacted to this. And to be quite honest, from a, from a historical perspective, I'm disappointed on us as Latinx people for not being louder in this, in this fight, uh, as if uh, our Afro-Latinx, Afro, you know, Afro-descendientes, are not in the same amount of risk or, you know, from different perspectives, right? So hope that we're having conversations we haven't had before, that I've engaged with people around um, clearly light-skinned Latinos who are like, well, I'm not white and I don't have any privilege. It's like, you need to stop and think. And, you know, it's those conversations you really don't expect to have with your friends. Yeah. Um, and yet, you know, and hopefully, that we can continue to have the conversations and yet there's a sense of disappointment um but i'm fascinated by the response i'm fascinated by the fact that it's the how long 
this, oh, is this the time? Is this the moment? Is this, we've been here before and the system beat us up to, to, you know, to give us hope and then dash it. So there's a skeptical moment in my thinking about today as I um, sit in my house with all the privileges that I have, uh, knowing that when I walk out of my door, I lose at least three quarters of those privileges. Um, and yet I will never lose as much as my black brothers and, and sisters do. And so um, for those of us who've been troublemakers or our whole life, I've been training for this, right? And all of a sudden I find myself kind of, because COVID, you know, <laughs> uh, in my house without being able to do everything I want to do, yeah. um, and finding a ways, to, the, the good thing about this particular moment is that there are ways like we're doing right now to do something about it. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily have to be physical. Um, we can still be there in the revolution, in the moment, in the struggle, um, even if it's virtual. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Ignacio, how about you? What are your, what are your thoughts? Uh, uh, for me, it was, uh, you know, very shocking when I was watching the news and seeing how the police was killing the, the, the person because he was, you know, asking for help and uh, telling him that he couldn't breathe and he never listened. And the other two people on his back also. And I was thinking to myself, you know, how can this be possible? Yeah. You know, they, uh, the guy is dying and he, you know, did, uh, nobody did, uh, of those policemen did nothing to, to help uh, the guy, even if he was doing something, but I don't think he deserved that kind of death you know but what was uh like very shocking for me and now as i see all these people protesting i feel like you know this is very needed people need to know and now with the social media the phones with cameras we've been able to you know record those things but how many other uh times before happened and nobody knew you know yeah and that's a blessing that now we have these phones and we can record and you know and have those uh how i say proofs you know mm -hmm. because they can say whatever they they say but it's very clear that the police killed the guy yeah you know there because he was you know suppressing so uh and this kind of new revolution also something that really bothers me is like our president don't come out and you know do a positive thing to stop this protest because he has the power to come and say something nice okay we want to take care of this we want to see how the police make changes in the police something like that but seems like he uh you know <laughs> i don't know how to say he is uh you know make us more angry yeah. you know with all those things people get more angry and the protest gets you know you know, bigger and those things instead of coming out and, you know, being, you know, in our side and say, oh, I know we want to make some changes, things like that. But how I say uh, these things help, you know, to yeah, do better things. And last but not least, Jose, what, how are you processing what's been going on? I think it's a similar feelings, uh, angry, frustration, I feel really sad. I feel really upset. Um, I think uh, some of the, this incident and another incident that we have, you know, in the country with another African-American uh, community people are terrible. And, and I feel really frustrated when I see the video of the police putting that knee on the, on the head of, of, of the guy. And I cry, I feel like, you know, there were like two or three more police close by and nobody just act. It's like pretending that everything was okay. And I feel really upset. I, 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 I really hope, I really hope that something good coming with this protesting and these new laws. And I'm very happy that uh, our mayor she put some uh, painting uh, in, in the street, in 16th Street, yeah. and, and they put the name of <laughs> the 16th Street, Black Lives Matter, which yeah. I think is, is, is wonderful. 
And I think, I think they need to change the policies to treat African-Americans. And I, I just feel really angry. And, and when I see the video, I just, my heart is broken because it, it's, yeah. it's, it's sad. It's really sad. Yeah. And we cert let's certainly hope that everything that's happening spurs some long overdue change that has needed to take place in this country for a very, very long time. And so with that said, I want to kind of go back to the original content of tonight's discussion is the 20th anniversary of the Latino History Project. And I think, for, I think it's good for folks to remember to, you know, hear a little bit about what the project did. And so I'm going to ask Jose to just, you know, briefly talk about the project, why you decided it was necessary to have something like that and just talk a little bit about what it contains. So just give us an overview of the, of the project itself. Um, well, there were, I always been obsessed uh, preserving our history, our Latinx LGBTQ history. And I think one of the things that moved me to do uh, the organization, that was when Llegó, uh, our national Latina, Latino, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender organization called <laughs> Yevo. <laughs> um, they closed the doors. Yeah. So that was very that was painful for me and for many, many of my friends um, because Yevo was serving more than 175 groups affiliated in the country. So uh, little by little, you know, I, I start, uh, you know, trying to, to, to see what can I do to preserve our history. Um, so I, I start doing presentations, you know, with the La Clinica del Pueblo, with Whitman Walker Clinic, with the Lesbian Service Program of, of the Whitman Walker Clinic, and start getting ideas to preserve our history for future generations. And um, so in, in 2000, during the march, during the national march, there was an organization here called GELAM, Gente Latina de Ambiente, uh -huh. which, which that was Edgardo Guerrero, Sofia Carrero, Carmen Chavez, uh, Manuel Sandoval, and uh, another friend, Perry Miranda, Perry Miranda. So they create this, uh, the second group. So they support me to do the, 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 the first exhibit during the National March. And then uh, start working. Uh, we met in 17th, in my apartment first here in 17th Street. And then we met at the Lesbian Service Program in uh, Whitman Walker Clinic. And they start like that, but I, I, I want to, I want to um, mention that there was a lot of people involved and I want to give credit for. Um, I, uh, Leti was uh, our uh, uh, vice president, uh, Lisbeth, she helped us when we organized the first events. Ignacio, he was very, very uh, 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 helping. Esther Hidalgo, Veronica, Gloria Valdez, Juan Novoa, he was our uh, treasurer. My ex-boyfriend, uh, Paul Scott, which he designed the logo, he designed the logo. Um, Anaconda, Michelle Medrano, Ranal, Antonio, David, Jose. There were many people, this is some people, and I want to give credit also to the organization before I forget. I want to thank La Clinica del Pueblo because La Clinica del Pueblo play an important role. Human Rights Campaign, the DC Center, the Latino Smithsonian, the Mayor's Office on Latino Affairs, the Mayor's Office of LGBTQ Affairs, BHT, Brother Help Itself, Whitman Walker Clinic, Capital Pride, Latin American Youth Center. And I want to mention two universities that also helped me in the beginning, uh, American University, uh, UDC, and the Gallaudet, the Gallaudet University. But, but that was the, you know, that was the beginning, just trying to 
question of uh, working with the programs. And um, I just want to give credit to a lot of people, a lot of volunteers. Yeah. Uh, Letty, I'd like to go to you next. Um, why did you decide it was, in, why did you want to become involved with this project? What, what was your motivation to become part of this? And I'll ask Elizabeth the same question after, after you. So what, what made you become, what, what drove you to become part of this project? Well, I think first of all, you know, I'm from Texas and I um, grew up not knowing what my Mexican Chicano history was because it was it was always told through the lens of of white um, historians. Yeah. And and, um, and uh, after having been involved, uh, I've been in DC over 30 years, involved with. Uh, Enlace, which was the precursor to Quilam, uh, which was another Latin organization, um, and also involved with Diego, which as Jose mentioned earlier, it, it was clear that all that if we did not preserve our history, future generations would not know it. And um, and I've and I've actually experienced this because. I remember going to a, a National Gay and Lesbian Task Force Creating Change Conference and sitting in the back of a room of Latino activists and they said, oh, we need to develop, we need to create a national organization. And I, and I remember, this was after Yago had closed and I remember thinking, well, okay, first of all, they didn't know a national organization that even existed. And uh, so, and this was only like three years after it had closed. So it was clear to me that if we, if some, if we do not write our own history, tell our own history, preserve our own history, uh, we can't really rely on other people to do it for us. And so that's why what Jose was, has been doing for the last 20 years was important to support. Uh, Lizbeth, same question. Why did you want to become involved in this project? Uh, so from a Similar but different perspective, you know, different starting point that led the. Um, it's difficult to highlight that is that which is invisible. Uh, when you when you think about who we are as Latinx people, who we are as queer people, how far ago did our um, history started? Right, um, from the founding of the Imperial Court to so much more uh, that even our own didn't know how much we had done for ourselves. Right? We, uh, we, we're approaching the 20th anniversary of uh, the, the history project. That is also how long ago Diego has been gone. Mm -hmm. So I speak about Diego now and people don't know what it is. <laughs> They have no idea that we ever had a national organization, never mind the attempts after that. Diego, well, what, it, what is that, right? And there's this, even at that point, you knew that time would come when people will forget, because we forget. Uh, we don't talk about it out of shame. We don't, well, however many reasons you might have for that. So for me, when Jose started doing this, there was two things going on at the time. One, it was that I was sitting uh, in the movement in a position that allowed me to offer help, right? Uh, to spaces that had been denied to us in the, in the past. And here I was all of a sudden with the keys, with the keys to the front door, I was like, oh yeah, this is, come on in, right? Yeah. Um, but second, because if we don't record what it is that we've gone through, all that we know is that Stonewall happened and even today, the images, the real people who were there, the Afro United Stadiums, the, the Latinx people who were in that bar who said, you know what, enough is enough, I've had it. It would be whitewashed. Yeah. And somebody had to do it and Jose had the, the vision to do it. Nobody had come to me with that vision. Because our vision as people in the movement, 90% of the time, is like, we're going to create archives and they're going to be an ex university. And then nothing happens. There's, there's no cataloging. There's no, and that's not, a, you know, 
But if I were to say to somebody, if you want to learn a lot about our history, you should go to University UT Austin and ask for the Diego archives. First of all, you're going to have to find somebody who knows where they are. Uh, and second, then you have to have the time to go through it because they haven't been cataloged. And that's not anybody's fault, but the way in which the system works, yeah. which means that the, those who follow us will not have the same access because they will not have the right information to access them. Uh, and so if somebody's willing to do that, to catalog it, to put it out there, to begin showing it to the world, and it reflects my history back to me, my pride back to me, I'm in. And when Jose asked, all of those things happened in my head. And I said, when do we start? What do you need? Absolutely. Um, Ignacio, I want to ask you this question. Um, we're celebrating the 20th anniversary of the project. And this may sound like an obvious question because we have new technology and everything so forth. But how has the project changed over the last 20 years based on your experience working with it? Can you shed some light on just how receiving artifacts or documents Talk about just how that process has changed over the last 20 years. Um, I think uh, change in uh, the way that uh, when Jose first started uh, this project, he started, you know, this project with his own money. He uh, <laughs> but, uh, put his money to start this uh, project. And I, I know Jose because he came, uh, since he came from Atlanta to live in Washington, D.C. We were together also for a, a while. And then um, I've been seeing how this, uh, the, you know, the Latino history project start from, uh, from, yes, Jose working in his house to go into a, to a something bigger. I saw how uh, the project was, you know, advancing every year, changing, you know, going from uh, had uh, Jose asking for pictures and posters and and finding information about the uh, the Latino gay community in the area through uh, why uh, I think then went through to they found a, 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 I think a office in Whitman Walker and then they you know it's been growing and growing and growing up to what is now they uh, did amazing events uh, in the community, they started the first uh, Latino gay pride in, in DC. We did not have one. And uh, Jose started also. And also all those projects they, uh, that they were, uh, you know, acknowledging people that uh, were doing things in the community by having their projects. And up to what is now, it's been, you know, growing a lot. Well, say, talk about some of the challenges that the project has had over the years, especially in terms of, you know, finding things to archive and to preserve. Talk about just what does that process look like and how is that, what are some of the challenges that have you confronted over the years as you try to do that? I think, I think the most difficult time for an organization is the first five years because what you do is you're working in the organization, in the bylaws, in the board of directors, in um, de developing the programs and getting uh, people. And then um, the, the first five years are very critical. I, this is what I think, you know, um, as a Latinas and Latinos, um, we also uh, sometimes uh, we don't have the resources to do to do everything, so uh, for instance, in my case, uh, you know, I I was always obsessed with history. I born and raised in Mexico in the border, and uh, we crossed the border, my family to Atlanta, and um, you know, I was always wondering why we don't have heroes, Latinx, LGBTQ, and then I discovered Silvia Rivera and Jose Saria and many, many more people. It's many more people who are doing fantastic uh, things in the community. And then um, some of the things of, of the collection, I, I get it from friends. 
Uh, some people give me so, and I buy a, a lot of things. I have some a collection of Jose Saria. And I want to show you this picture. This is one of the uh, mm -hmm. big uh, pictures that we have at the um, oh, wow. Washington Historical Society. And uh, with everybody. When was, when was that taken, Jose? I believe it's, that was in 2009. 2009. Uh, with everybody, Ronald and people from Whitman Walker, people from La Clinica. And this picture is from Lisbeth because Lisbeth, I asked Lisbeth to be uh, how our end. a little bit closer to the, yeah, this is, oh wow, okay. And yeah. what is that we're looking at? The, yeah, that was in the old building of the DC Center. So okay. I asked Lisbeth to help us to be a, a, a MC. So we have an exhibit, uh, you know, an exhibit, and then we honor some people and we give some awards, including to Letty. Yeah. Um, and me. <laughs> this, one, this one is one of the first also ex uh, uh, exhibits. It's Letty, Letty, uh, Eva Young, and oh, this yeah. Rick Mendoza, and another friend. Uh, that was in Human Rights on the first Latino Pride. Is that this one? And, um, and Jose, when was the first? When was that first Pride? Do you remember what? Th that remember? was with today. I mean, I'm sorry, 14 years ago. Okay. 14 Great. years ago, I believe. I believe that was in 2007. 2007. And that was in honor of Silvia Rivera. Okay. And we have a panel, we, we have uh, Ruby Corrado, and we have Ivan Torres, um, Laura Esquivel, and another friends. Um, but but um, it is important to mention that, that the 20 anniversary because I think we are the oldest Latino LGBTQ yeah. local, local organization with more years. Um, I believe that, uh, you know, it is important for us, for Latinas and Latinos, you know, to support each other because sometimes we don't have the resources to, to yeah. do it. And yeah, but that was my next, I was actually going to pick up on something you said earlier, Jose, was that you talked about just, you know, you started this in your house, basically. Um, so Letty, I want to turn it to you a little bit. Um, how has the project over the years been able to access funding or has it been able to access funding to archive and to preserve this wonderful history that you're trying to preserve? Talk a little bit about how you're able to get financial support to do the work that you've done as a project. Well, I think, um, I mean, I wasn't uh, in, involved with that part, but I know that uh, the, the project's been very successful over the years. Uh, I think Jose mentioned a number of them, you know, us helping us, brother, brother help thyself, um, you know, uh, grants from the DC Office of Latino Affairs, um, and uh, so, and and then just fundraising. I mean, there was um, a number of years where they had where uh, there was a, uh, every September there's a, you know it's Hispanic Heritage Month. And so there would be a, a major event and that raised funds. And so all of those things combined, I think really helped to um, sustain the organization. It's all volunteers, it's you know, 100% volunteers, nobody's paid. Uh, so uh, over the years that that combination has really helped to uh, also, you know, show and exhibit materials. And um, uh, I think that it's, uh, it's something that's important uh, to just continue. And um, one other question I wanted to ask too, because I always find this kind of curious to like pick people's brains a little bit. Um, I'll ask Ignacio this question. Um, is there any particular artifact or part of the project that resonates most personal to you or that you find most worthwhile? Or is it just this whole initiative? So if you were to think of one specific thing that you seen come out of this over the last 20 years, what would that be? And I know that's a very difficult question to ask, but um, <laughs> I'm sure there's hundreds and hundreds of different things, but if, is there one particular part of this collection that stands out to you more than anything? 
<laughs> it's hard to put you on the spot. Like that, but. I really think that one of the things is that this uh, project come from nothing to where it is now. You know, from the vision and the dream of uh, Jose uh, trying to preserve the history of the Latino community. Uh, I, you know, at that time, I thought, oh, it's Jose and his dreams. He's maybe going to have here this. <laughs> no, that, that was going to be what it is now. Yeah. That's what I really, you know. Yeah. You know, it's, my friend is crazy. You know, he <laughs> always want to get into things and do, but then I was looking through the time that he was really, you know, getting this, this thing put in together and, you know, up to what it is now. Yeah. And it's like, wow, <laughs> you know, yeah. yeah, because I went to uh, many of the activities and they were so professional, so good. Now, the, uh, as I say before, the the uh, first Latino uh, gay pride start from a little, you know, reunion and this and that, and then went from a big thing because they used to do a uh, big, uh, you know, Latino pride when town used to be, you know, was so nice, so well uh, put down that that's what I, I think, you know, that I see from being like a dream and something that I thought Jose was just, you know, getting crazy, trying to get ice. But <laughs> from yeah. what it is now, is like that. I know, yeah. Elizabeth, I know we saw a couple of your photos from earlier. Um, the same question to you, what's the most memorable part of this whole project for you as somebody who's been involved with this for so long? Again, any specific artifact or project or whatever that you think back on more fondly than others? Um, one is very selfish. Uh, and it, you know, was to be part of the recognition around Women's Month, right? Uh, as, a, as a Latina queer leader. Because uh, there's something very special from people, your people, recognizing who you are. And it's not because I wanted the award and you know, so, but it, it, it was the moment of seeing my friends in a room together with whom I have a long history, right? Um, Letty and her wife Ruth and you know, my wife and my friends and others in that room is super important um, and super memorable to me. Um, Pictures like the one that Jose just showed is really funny because he's saying this is a picture of Lisbeth. And so I've changed a lot since that moment. <laughs> uh, so to see the back of my head, I was like, hey, at least I was consistent with my haircut. Um, but um, <laughs> what, that, what that picture brought is it's, it's that it reflects back to us what it is that we collectively can achieve, right? It's, it's it, what is great about that position, that, that picture was not me being in the picture, but when you take a look at what we were trying to capture in that picture, which was, by the way, the moment the picture was taken, I was speaking about, about Letty. I remember that picture very well. I was speaking about Letty. Letty was being given an award and I was the MC, and I took privilege and I spoke a little bit more than even the, the person who was going to present the award for, for Letty. Um, mm. And part of that, because you know, not to put Letty on the spot, but mm -hmm. she is a mentor to many of us. Yeah. Yes. Around perseverance, about what it means to encounter difficult moments, about what it means to not give up on us when we become difficult, and to heal even when we betray one another. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and those are things that, you know, so to have the opportunity to recognize those of us who, through the years have kept going at this like the water on a stone, uh, making a mark and yet not quite being noticed until something cracks. Uh, it's important. Yeah. What is also important and, 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 and memorable is the fact that we're, we had a place, we have a place to drop our own memories. Uh, 
I, you know, I recently, about four years ago, moved from one location, you know, from one house to another, and I assembled a box of memories. And I looked at them and I was like, am I, you know, some of them obviously I kept. And then I called Jose, I said, I have some gifts for you. Mm. Um, you know, from Diego, from Encuentros, from, you know, all that stuff. And I knew that they would be safe. That my memories, even if I forgot them, would be safe. And that's, that's incredibly memorable, right? It's like, it, it, there's a sense of relief, a, bre a, a breath of fresh air that comes into knowing that everything that others call clutter, we call history. Yeah. And that that clutter, that history can be collected and presented in a line that says, you might have won this episode, but the war is ours and we're winning it a moment at a time. And here's a timeline and how you've kept thinking we're not moving. And yet we're so further, well, as much as we have to go, we have accomplished so much. Yeah, absolutely. And I have a place to go to say, learn. Learn about us. Learn from me. Um, and that, you know, that is just, that's just, yeah. It's wonderful. Um, we have a few minutes left, so I want to wrap it up with a couple of questions. Um, one of the questions that Jose and I talked about when we were going over this was, uh, what are the lessons learned? I, I mean, maintaining an archive for 20 years is very difficult, I'm sure. Um, so Jose, I'll ask, since you and I talked about this, I'll ask you the question. Um, what are the lessons learned from the last 20 years in terms of how you archive things? What do you look for? With whom do you work? Um, so talk about that if you could, uh, the lessons you've learned over the last 20 years with this project. Um, first of all, I think it's extremely, extremely important to preserve our history. Anyone who has collections, please keep it or make different copies and preserve the, the copies either in the university, for example, the Austin uh, University, I forget the name, or the Historical Society, or with another, El Museo del Barrio in New York, or in another museums. My advice is, uh, I always tell people, do like three or four copies of the documents. And then if you want to create your own collection, that's fine, that's fine but tr be sure to do like three copies. And uh, when you're ready, just try to uh, donate it. We have different museums in, in, in the city, uh, the uh, Washington Historical Society, uh, the uh, Smithsonian, and another institutions, uh, but uh, please make different copies that you can have the copies or scan, scan the documents in USB and preserve it. You can preserve it in acid-free, either boxes or paperwork. Um, but it is very important to preserve our how our history. It is. It is. Um, Ignacio, same question to you. Um, lessons learned over your work with your your time with the project, and what would you say to folks who are trying to maybe do a similar project, not in DC necessarily, necessarily, but say here in Miami or in Denver or wherever, what would your, what would your advice be? I would uh, say that uh, preserving uh, the history, this, this is the LGBT Latino history in Washington, Washington DC or other history is very important, you know, for the future generations, then they can see, you know, what we did or what we went through, you know, because uh, as you can see right now, things are very, very, very different from 20 years ago, mm -hmm. you know? And then future generations can uh, benefit from learning, you know, what happened before and how things are now. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then just to wrap up, and this has been a wonderful conversation. I'm so grateful to have the chance to talk with you all. Um, so to wrap it up, um, I, let's certainly hope that the project continues for another 20 years and longer. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to ask Letty this question, where do you see the project going in the next 20 years? Like 
let's say, you know, phase two. I hate, you know, we're all living in like phase one, phase two of, you know, coronavirus reopening and stuff. But <laughs> talk about phase, what does phase two of the, the project look like, you know, moving forward in the next 20 years? What do you, what are your well, you know, um, ho hopefully it is, you know, uh, that this is a, actually, this is a day of transition. I don't know if uh, uh, Jose has, has it told us, yet, has it announced it publicly, I don't think. But he's, you know, he's going to be ste he's stepping away from the project after 20 years, um, and uh, this is uh, this is a transition period. Um, and thankfully, there are young, you know other people, younger people, who are wanting to continue the Latino History Project. Um, they're going to have their own ideas about how to do this. They're going to have their own challenges, obviously, because it's an organization. Um, but I'm uh, I'm thankful to Jose for all the years that you dedicated to this Jose, and for all the people that you brought along with you to do this project and keep it going for 20 years. And um, I'm uh, you know we owe you a great debt because uh, it, it's it's. Uh, it's it's a it's a testament to your perseverance and your passion yeah. that it that it has existed for twenty years, uh, and that there's a group of people that want to continue it. That's important. That they, they want to continue it. Uh, so um, I think that the the lessons the lessons of the past are are you know, we should always take note of the lessons, and uh, and then figure out how to do something you know different and better. Uh, and uh, so I'm. Again, thankful. I just want to say on here, thank you, Jose, for what you've done. And um, and uh, Lizbeth, same really, question. Um, you were, um, um, where does the where do you see the project going in the next twenty years from from where we are today? Um, I do think things evolve and change, um, and they'll take. You know, I I will echo Letty in saying that not just the DC Latinx community, but the Latinx queer community across America Latina with the United States included, mm -hmm. owe a great debt to Jose uh, in collecting and keeping so many of our memories. And I hope that as we evolve, that we're able to grow that base of knowledge and to recognize whose shoulders we stand on in order to continue to move forward. Um, I also hope that we create a series of scholarships across, you know, uh, colleges and universities that focus on Hispanic-serving populations, right? Like you, like you know, University of Texas Austin and others, and that within those that have library studies, uh, assign a scholarship to a young librarian or archivist or research person to collect and actually document and. Uh, catalog the materials uh, because it's not just enough for us to have them. We also need to have the press the uh, what do you call it precedence of those artifacts uh, so people know that they were not pulled out of thin airs. That they for every picture you see, there's a story, there's a person, uh, and so those are my two dreams. That our evolution is. Uh, historically based, no pun intended, maybe, uh, in that we, as people become in the future, that now that people are more open and more out of the closet or more interested in our history, that they are fields of study that we haven't looked at that could bring so much to what we do in library studies is one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I hope that at some point we're able to get a benefactor or raise monies that even if it's a small amount that we can give to a Latinx queer individual studying library, you know, library sciences uh, to create projects that are to catalog whatever, whatever their, their university is based, the Latinx history, queer history around them and deposit it into places that we can then type into our Google and find. So they, they're accessible to all of us, both physically and virtually, so that we don't forget. Mm -hmm. Very well said. And then Jose, I'd like to give you the final word, actually. So um, <laughs> since you're the inspiration behind all of this, um, your final <laughs> thoughts about the next, you know, your tenure and where the project is going to go in its next 
in its next incarnation. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I just feel really to serving uh, my community, our community, and preserving all the documents, uh, banners, and it's so many stories, many stories, and uh, many people that we need to thank to, you know, um, uh, volunteers, people who was uh, helping us uh, in the beginning of the project. Um, I want to thank also the Rainbow History Project because the Rainbow History Project play an important role. The Latino Smithsonian too, and many people, many volunteers, the, the, all the board of directors, and thank you. I, I feel really humble because it's 20 years. Um, I feel happy. I feel happy because we educate many people in many events. Uh, I feel happy because I inspire many people to love history. And history is very important. It is really important to um, recognize and preserve uh, the uh, contributions of our sisters and brothers. Um, it is very important and, 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 and I'm very happy to serve our community and, and, and uh, you know, uh, collect and preserve uh, the history, not only for Washington DC, but they give me the opportunity to go to Mexico City and present in Mexico City. And, and um, I'm, I'm really happy. I'm going to take the positive things in this uh, 20 years. And again, in, again, I need to uh, uh, thank uh, Letty Gomez, which is my sister, and I love it. I love it. Lisbeth Melenda Rivera, that is my other sister, eh, y también la quiero con el alma. Ignacio, Ignacio has been with the community for years and years and years, organizing Miss Gay Mexico, helping the community, helping uh, people everywhere. And I want to help to thank you too for for helping, you know, helping us. Um, I want to thank the Washington Blade and you and you know for covering our issues. And and I'm very happy. I, I feel so good because I know in my mind and in my heart that that that, that the moments that we invest, those are a beautiful moments for our community. You know, organizing the community, doing the meeting, doing the brainstorming, doing creating the programs, working with the bylaws, and 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 I'm very happy. I'm very happy, and and I'm going to be here in DC, uh, probably working in another project. You know, <laughs> I'm also working in my book, little by little, little by little, but I'm working in my book. Um, but I'm very thankful. I'm very thankful. And if I'm, if I didn't mention any a, a person or a leader in in, in, in in this presentation, I'm excuse myself. But there's so many people uh, with the government and, and leaders and people and organizations. So I'm very thankful. I'm very thankful. Well, Jose, you're you're a treasure to our community in DC. Tú eres un gran tesoro para nosotros aquí en mundo. So, gracias por tu trabajo. Thank you so much for everything you've done. And I think that's a really great way to wrap up this conversation. So, I want to thank Leti, Jose, Lisbeth, and Ignacio for taking time on a Friday night to uh, talk with us about this wonderful project and to share your thoughts. And, um, and we'll continue. We look forward to seeing what the next 20 years looks like. So, muchísimas gracias from here in Miami. And we then say, Gracias a ti. También, Michael. Thank you. Gracias, Michael. Enjoy, Michael. We'll uh, continue to follow what the next 20 years look like. So have a good weekend, and uh, thank you all so much. All right. Take care. Good night. Good night. Bye, Bye Leticia.